Situational awareness, the fundamental component of defensive driving. That's what we're talking about tonight. Where am I? What's going on? What road users are on the roadway? And the reason that I use road users and not vehicles is due to the fact that you are sharing space on roadways with pedestrians, cyclists, people on scooters, skaters, uh, those types of things, uh, motorcycle riders. These are all road users. They are not drivers. They are not riders, okay? So keep that in mind when you're driving. The other piece about this, and I've talked about this previously, at intersections, more than 40% of crashes, ha crashes happen at intersections. 42% is the number specifically. As well, at intersections, you are most likely to encounter vulnerable road users. Vulnerable road users encounter are those road users, pedestrians, People using mobility devices, uh, kids on e-scooters, e-bikes, cyclists, motorcycle riders, those types of things. Those people who are most likely either going to be seriously injured or killed in a crash are vulnerable road users. These are the people that you're going to encounter at intersections. So have situational awareness, discover and figure out where intersections are and how to locate intersections and other vehicles coming out at the intersection. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s hauling freight between Ontario, Canada and the lower 48. Uh, that's a specific kind of North American term, lower 48. That means the states below the 47th, 49th, 49th parallel here in Canada. Uh, well, I was going to university in Australia, uh, 2000 to 2006. I drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997, uh, graduated in 2006 with my doctorate in legal history, uh, which seems like yesterday, but it was quite a number of years ago. <laughs> uh, my doctorate is in legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons, and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. And one piece of wisdom that I can impart to you about uh, traffic laws Traffic laws no more prevent crime, or traffic laws no more prevent traffic crashes than criminal law prevents crime. They work to a certain degree to control order on our roadways, but they do not prevent crimes. And this is why we're talking about situational awareness tonight, to give you some information about being a safer, smarter driver. And Corey's put up the link for the complete autobiography. You want to read that over at the Smart Drive Test uh, website. Uh, that's got some funny bits in it as well, so have a look at that. Uh, new shorts this week, uh, better braking in winter conditions with an automatic transmission. <laughs> and yes, this is controversial, and I have quite a number of people telling me that on snow and ice, you need to gear down and use engine braking. And I will tell you uh, after the presentation why you should not use engine braking uh, in the winter time. The first point that I will make about engine braking and gearing down uh, either an automatic transmission or a manual transmission at any time is why would you use a $20,000 drivetrain to save $1,000 brakes? From an economic standpoint, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. As well, why would you work that hard? <laughs> I simply don't want to work that hard. All right. Uh, and the other short that we put up this week is, will I fail my driver's test if somebody honks at me? Short answer is no. The long answer is yes, probably you will fail your driver's test. So we'll talk more about that after the presentation. All right. Priorities when you're driving, because we cannot be 100%, 24-7, focused on driving. We need times when our attention is going to wane, our attention is going to lapse because we're tuning the radio, we're talking to passengers in the vehicle, we're taking a sip of coffee and those types of things. But there are times to do that when you're driving and you need to have situational awareness of what kind of traffic situation you are in. Are you managing space effectively? Because you need space in front of your vehicle. You need to be back one vehicle length from traffic in front of you when you're stopped in a queue so that you have time to work, time to think, time to observe because this is all part and parcel of your situational awareness. What is the traffic uh, on the roadway and what kind of roadway are you on? Do I simply need calm, calm awareness to be monitoring the situation, to observing what's going on with other traffic, what other traffic users are doing, or is there a unpredictable kid on a bicycle on the sidewalk 
that is not going in a straight line and doesn't have great control of their bicycle and you need to be covering the brake in case that they veer out onto the roadway. What do you need to be doing as a driver? And all of this comes with experience in driving. <coughs> Excuse me. The other piece is that you need to implement the smarter defensive driving principles. You need to know that everybody else on the roadway is participating in social driving. This is the way that they learn to drive. Most people on the roadway have little experience or little training beyond getting a driver's license, okay? Except for the smart drivers here hanging out on the channel and listening to the live stream. <laughs> Most other people simply got a driver's license, they get in their car and they drive every day and they drive the way that everybody else drives and they think that it's me against them. Everybody else is an idiot. That's not the way that it happens. Driving is a social activity and if there's certain skills and abilities that you put into place, signaling every time you change direction of the vehicle, shoulder checking every time you change direction of the vehicle, you're gonna have the habits and skills in place that are gonna keep you safe. Maybe not today, not next month, not next year, but maybe in five years from now, okay? Space management, I talk about this all the time. Have that three to, second, three to four second following distance in front of your vehicle. Stop back one vehicle length from the vehicle in front of you when stopped in a queue of traffic, all right? Observation, forward scanning pattern, 360 degree awareness around your vehicle. And same thing, I put a, a question up on the community tab last week about when should you be checking your mirrors? The correct answer is every 10 to 15 seconds. It's part of your forward scanning pattern. I even had a driving instructor, licensed driving instructor, quote unquote, from Texas tell me that that was incorrect. You only needed to check your mirrors every minute or so, which is completely false. Because as we know, traffic is dynamic and you need to have a continuous 360 degree awareness of where other road uses are around your vehicle. So observation, lane changing, turning, shoulder checking, reversing, and speed management. You need to understand the different speeds of different road user groups. That way, if you can understand speed differentials, you know that you are going to gain on a cyclist or a pedestrian much faster than you are another driver on the roadway. So understanding speed, controlling speed so that you can control space in front of your vehicle. All right. And then finally, communicating, communicating effectively with other traffic because your communication is your backup. Yes, you observed before you made the turn. You did your shoulder checks and those types of things, but you missed somebody. You missed the pedestrian that stepped off the curb next to your car because they're gonna walk around behind you because you stopped in the wrong position accidentally. But you managed to signal correctly so other road users can help you out because you communicated about your intent of what you're going to do on the roadway. Mapping and tracking other road users at intersections. As I said in the introduction, 40% of crashes happen at intersections. It's about 42% for uh, the exact number. This is also the place that you're going to encounter vulnerable road users. And most of the transit crashes that I investigate, it's usually that a bus has hit a pedestrian or a pedestrian got hit getting off or on the bus, or they've hit a cyclist. And this happens at intersections because this is the place where you're most likely to encounter vulnerable road users. At intersections, you need to map and track road users and you need to track them because are they going to cross your path of travel where you want to go? Because we're sharing road space with other road users and it's not about right of way. I have the right of way because I'm turning on an advanced left green, but the pedestrian insists that they're going to walk in the crosswalk. You have to give way to prevent a crash because think about how badly you would feel if you hit a pedestrian, okay? So it's simply a matter of waiting a moment, waiting five seconds for the person to clear the path of travel where you're going to go and then proceeding on your way, okay? Are we alert to change? Because that is what traffic is about. It is about change all the time. And crashes happen because other drivers do something unpredictable. That's when we're going to get into trouble. Where am I? Am I sitting in traffic? Am I driving on a highway? Am I trying to pass another vehicle? There are times when you're very close to other vehicles, you're passing on a highway, that you're going to be on high alert. There's other times you just need common awareness of what you're doing. You're bombing down the interstate, you're on cruise control, you have some great music on the radio, you know, some CCR, and you're just like chilling out. But 
you've managed space well in front of you, you're not tailgating other vehicles, you're not weaving in and out of traffic, and you are ha uh, maintaining a 360 degree awareness around your vehicle, okay? You're still, uh, for young drivers, you're still learning to determine gaps, especially on left-hand turns, so don't get pressured. This is the other piece of social driving. The peer pressure of driving and hurry up and go is very real, okay? Do not underestimate that. So for new drivers and drivers with not a great deal of experience, make sure that you do not succumb to that pressure. Focus on what you're doing. Give them a little wave, say, yeah, whatever, and take a deep breath and then carry on and go when you feel safe going, okay? Different kinds of driving environments that you will encounter in a very short space of time when you're driving. Residential roads, industrial, parks and schools. I've got schools twice. Uh, Multi-lane cities. Uh, Two-lane cities, or multi-lane roads in a city, two-lane roads in a city, freeways and interstates, rural country roads, towns and villages. All of these are going to have different road users and they're going to have different requirements put on you as a driver. Now, I'm going to tell you that freeways, yes, they're high speed. Uh, new drivers are terrified of merging onto freeways, but these are very safe. The reason that freeways and interstates are very safe is due to the fact that they don't have something called intersections, okay? They have eliminated intersections and the true name for freeways and interstates is limited access highway. There are only certain places that you can get on and off a freeway or an interstate. And we have significantly reduced the number of crashes on highway on freeways and interstates because we don't have intersections. All the traffic is going the same way and slow moving vehicles are not allowed on these roadways. Rural country roads, this is where most fatal crashes happen. There's a lot of reasons why fatal crashes happen on two lane country roads. You need to develop habits that will keep you safe. As I said, shoulder checking every time you change directions of the vehicle, signaling every time you change directions of the vehicle, having that three to four second following distance in front of your vehicle and stopping a traffic one vehicle length back. If you can do those four skills, that will put you in the 90th percentile of drivers on the roadway with the highest skill available. And it's going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash because we know that other drivers follow too close. And the, and the reason we know that is because the number one crash in North America is rear end crashes tailgating other drivers are tailgating and are too close to the traffic in front of them so they're either following too close which is probably the most probable answer or they're misjudging the speed differential between their vehicle and other vehicles and they rear end them because they're climbing they're going too fast in relation to that other vehicle or they misjudge that the other vehicle has stopped or slowed down young drivers are also dealing with the four d's drinking driving dating and distractions and distractions are not just young drivers. Distractions are for everybody who has a phone in their pocket and distractions are for everybody who has a newer vehicle, I would say newer than 2015 when telematics started coming out and they started putting the goofy screen in the middle of the dash on your vehicle. Any vehicle that has a telematic screen in it is going to cause you distractions in your vehicle. And the other piece that's distracting when you're driving, uh, all of the computer screens, uh, the instrument panels and those types of things. I mean, why do you need seven different layouts for the instrument panel in your car? <laughs> I have an old 1998 Honda CRV, which I affectionately call the buggy. It has an analog dashboard on it. It has one layout and it works just fine. I don't need seven different layouts of the tachometer and the speedometer and other information uh, from the gauges and dials in the dash. Okay, so drinking, the other problem with drinking, and I've talked about this with the GLP program, the graduated licensing program has not reduced the number of crashes amongst young people. It has simply pushed the uh, driving age for young people up to 18, 19, 20 years old. And now it's a problem because now you have drinking and driving coinciding together as a new experience. Okay. And we have not reduced the number of drinking and driving crashes on our roadways, unfortunately. Okay. And then of course there's dating. Most 16, 17, 18 year olds are getting their first dating experience. So all of this is coming together 
for new drivers on our roadways. Communication and observation, these are the keys to situational awareness and keeping yourself safe when you're driving, okay? And I asked this question a few years ago on the community tab about why young drivers have so many crashes and many people believe that it was about experience. And it's also about lack of training because we do not give the training needed for new drivers to be able to develop the habits that they need to implement to keep themselves safe. Following distance, stopping in traffic one vehicle lengths back, signaling every time they change direction of the vehicle and shoulder checking because shoulder checking as far as uh, in my professional opinion is the first skill or habit that uh, drivers after getting a license lose because they don't have to do it anymore. So therefore it just goes the way of the dodo bird or the unicorn. Okay, communication and observation, that's a repeat, apologize. So you need to get the right information. For those of you hanging out here on the channel, watching the videos here on the Smart Drive Test channel, other channels, you're getting the right information about driving safely and what you need to do and the habits and skills you need to put in place to keep yourself safe as a new driver. So good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. We're talking about situational awareness tonight. Where am I? What driving environment am I in? And the driving environment that you're in determines what kind of road users you're going to be dealing with. If you're on a two lane country road in Southwestern Ontario, you're going to be in, sorry, in the summertime, so time season has an effect on this as well, you're gonna be dealing with farm equipment. If you're in a school area during school being in session, September to June, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's different in the Southern Hemisphere, you're gonna be dealing with students, okay? All right, Evan, what was I riding my bike on the road to practice driving? I was slowing down upon seeing a car at the intersection in case the driver wasn't going to stop but the driver stopped, uh, excessive or inappropriate use of any kind of self-defense could get you into legal trouble. By the way, how do I know that there's rain, the roads aren't too slippery to go at high speeds? Uh, because how do you know if the roads are slippery when it's raining? If there's moderate rain and you have good tires on your vehicle, you're going to be just fine when you're driving. If you have old tires that are bald, uh, you're not going to be safe at higher speeds because Poor tires, poor quality tires are going to lend themselves to hydroplaning or aquaplaning as it's called in other parts of the world. Riding up, the tire rides up on the surface of the water. And I have had that experience where I've had my tires that are getting old and worn down and dri driving in rain and much more prone to hydroplaning and those types of things. Now, if that is something that is happening when you're driving, do not use cruise control. Keep your foot on the uh, throttle, on the accelerator. And that way, when it starts to do that, the tires will start to spin, actually, and you'll hear the motor, wah, wah. And I had that happen a few months back. There was a lot of rain here, and I drove to Kelowna. And even with good quality tires on the vehicle, I have the winters on, and their tires, the tires are in really good nick. There's still a lot of hydroplaning and the tires just, you know, the engine, wah, wah, and just you keep your foot on the throttle. And as soon as you take your foot off the throttle and the vehicle slows down, then it'll sit down on the pavement again. But it's it's a little bit like the first time that ABS brakes engage on your vehicle. Uh, it can be a bit daunting and you're like, what the heck is going on? That's what's going on. Uh, Marion says that social pressure is really strong at times for hurry up and go, and yes it is. Uh, there are other people who are honking, telling you you're number one, giving you the finger, those types of things. So yes, know that social pressure can be very high and can force you to go when you shouldn't be going. And Corey's put up some great videos here for you to have a look at, how to turn safe, how to turn left safely, how to shoulder check, and as well how to drive safely in the rain. Thank you for that, Corey. All right, and Rob, uh, yes, driving is about space, time, and thought. Only drive as fast as you can think. For me, that's slow. <laughs> I doubt it. You're well-educated, my friend. Degree in philosophy, you should be able to think a lot faster than most of us because, you know, you got all those complex philosophical thoughts going through your head while you're driving. Uh, Evan says to just be able to take the test without getting a license, watch videos from numerous channels. Uh, take free numerous online practice tests and looks at numerous articles. Yes, but you driving is not a spectator sport. Driving is something that you have to do to be able to get better at it. 
you can watch videos and you can get the right information and the, the right theory when you're learning to drive, but you need to get in the vehicle and you need to practice. Because as I said, there are so many different situations and scenarios when you're driving that in one situation, uh, nothing will happen. It will be completely innocuous. And in another situation, uh, the vehicles will change, the drivers will change, and then it will be dangerous. So know that for driving. Uh, Emily, the cabbies in Toronto have been brutal lately, pulling out from parking spaces without even looking, just jutting out, also changing lanes while cutting me off and not even signaling. That is very true, Emily. And uh, not signaling, that is part and parcel of social driving. It's just something that is going to happen. And it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. So know that when you're driving and look out for the taxis. I mean, they're bright colors for the most part, we can pick them out. And usually they have that roof ornament as well that will indicate that it's a taxi. So just give them lots of space, right? Uh, and uh, know that they're not gonna signal and they're just gonna pull out in front of you. So look for those, identify those. And this is the other piece about it is that if you know that one road user group, i.e. taxis in Toronto, are going to do unpredictable things, then those are the road users that you're on the lookout for when you're in Toronto. The other road user group in Toronto or large metropolitan cities, whether you're in Chicago or Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Los Angeles is cyclists, right? They're going to do unpredictable things because for the most part, cyclists do not follow the rules of the road. They don't stop at stop signs. Uh, they cut it in and out of traffic and those types of things. So know that and identify those road user groups. Keep yourself that space in front of you. That way you have uh, space to work, space to observe, figure out what they're doing. And then, you know, if you're coming up on a taxi, you know that the taxi is running. You can see the driver in the driver's seat. Uh, you've got your foot covering the brake and you're prepared for them to just dart out in front of you, right? You're prepared for them to make lane changes when you're out on the highway, the freeway or whatnot uh, without signaling and those types of things. Because the other piece about it, and this is an advanced uh, driver technique, is we know that other traffic, other road users, drivers, I'm looking for that word, where look, other drivers are going to make lane changes. When they make lane changes, they're gonna start moving over just ever so slightly just before they make the lane change. So whether they signal or not, we still know because the number one way that road users communicate is position of the vehicle on the roadway or in relation to the roadway or their relative speed changes. For example, we're coming up to an intersection we're within a half a block of the intersection, the car in front of us starts to slow down. If the car in front of us slows down and the traffic light is green, there's a high percentage, there's a high probability rather, there's a high probability that that driver is going to turn right. We know that because in relation to the intersection, that driver has slowed down. Even though they don't signal, we still know that. We know that the driver in front of us, we're on a multi-lane road, they start hugging the left side of the lane there's a high probability that they're gonna change lanes. Same with pedestrians. If they're near a crosswalk or near an intersection and they're just standing there looking around waiting, we can observe them and know that they are going to probably cross the roadway. So position of the vehicle, position of the road user within relation to the roadway, speed relative to different parts of the roadway, we can interpret actions of other road users on the roadway without them signaling or communicating. So know that as a driver, use that advanced driving skill when you're driving. Uh, Rob, how you position your car on the road is a form of communication. Love it, Rick. Uh, absolutely, Rob. And it's one of the pieces that we're missing in driver education is the position. And it's not just the position, it's relative speed, right? Is the speed slowing down or speeding up? in relation to an intersection because we know that cars are going to turn they're going to change lanes at intersections and those types of things right they're going into a service or those types of things so the car is slowing down even though they're not braking or they're not signaling we still know that there's a gas station right there and their speed is in relation to them moving and turning into that gas station that they're slowing down 
So we can figure that out. And this is something that obviously comes with experience. It's the same thing when you're on the roadway or on the highway rather, when you're on the highway, I can map and track other cars on the highway with their speed and know the difference in their speed in relation to mine, whether they're going a couple of miles slower, they're going a couple of miles faster, and I'm coming up on another car, I know my relative speed is faster than theirs and that I can preempt that and I can get out into the other lane without slowing my vehicle down because I know that they're going slower than me. And that is something that comes with experience. And I think it comes with experience with drivers where they start getting comfortable with the basics. Because when you first start driving, the first year of driving for new drivers, they're in the vehicle. Oh, I got a shoulder check. Oh, I'm changing directions. I got a shoulder check. They got to consciously think about that. So they're not able to focus on those higher driving skills because the fundamentals of driving are taking all of their time and energy. And it's only after a year, maybe two years of driving and they get those fundamentals into place, then they can start focusing on those higher advanced skills of figuring out how other traffic is communicating to them by the position of their vehicle on the roadway, by the relative speed of their vehicle in relation to other things on the roadway. All of that plays a, a role uh, with our experience as drivers as we become safer, smarter drivers. Ross and I am doing awesome. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, Mallory, really appreciate and love your shoulder check saying. Awesome. Yes, shoulder checking. Shoulder checking is to driving, not shoulder checking is to driving. What not checking to see if a weapon is loaded is to gun safety. Okay, you would never pick up a weapon and not see if it's loaded before handling it. It's the same thing as a, as a driving a car. Why on any planet would you drive a 2,500 pound vehicle at speed, change directions and not see if there is a road user in your blind area? You just, you wouldn't do that. Okay, so shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. Marizone, I often ignore when someone pressures to go fast, and that is awesome. That's exactly what you need to do, Marizone, to keep yourself safe. Uh, Marion, why is the novice license for two years, whereas the learning license is only a year? Uh, Marion, the reason the novice is for two years is owing to the fact that you can drive by yourself, whereas in the learner's phase, you can't drive by yourself. You have to have a mentor, your parents, your friends, somebody who has a license, or be in the vehicle with a driving instructor. So it's only a year. Now we know that the learners phase, even though students go and get their license and get their learners, they don't drive for the year. They simply let the clock tick over and six to eight weeks before they are eligible to go in and take their driver's test, then they get in the vehicle and they start to practice. It's just too onerous for parents, uh, for driving instructors, for the, for the students, for the young people, who are going to get a license is not all young people, but new drivers who have a learner's license. It's just too onerous, right? It's too much work. It's, it's hard work learning how to drive and it's hard work for everybody. It's hard work for the instructors. It's hard work for the mentors. It's hard work for the new driver. So 68 weeks before they're eligible to go in and get their license, they, they get in the vehicle and they start practicing and they start preparing for the driver's test. They just let the clock tick over. It was a, it was a good idea in theory, but it never worked out. It never worked out. And in the end, all that it did was uh, push up the age for when drivers are getting a license. So it was, you know, on one hand, we could kind of say it was the government's way of pushing up the driver's uh, license age, right? So now most people are getting their license 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, Rob says, judging speeds and distances come with... Uh, Stronger neural connections as they develop those pathways. Yes, indeed. Awesome. And Emily, I literally can't even move the vehicle without shoulder checking. And that is really good to hear. It becomes such a habit. Yes, it does. And that's what you want to do. You want to build these habits so that you don't have to think about it. Because defensive driving, situational awareness is not just for other people making mistakes. And I take it it bothers me a little bit when I have drivers come on the channel and they say, oh, I took driver's education and what I learned from it was is that everybody else is an idiot. Everybody else is the person I'm going to hit. Drive as if everybody else is going to run into you. No, no, 
<laughs> because we make mistakes too when we're driving. We forget to signal, we forget to shoulder check, we forget to look, we get tired, we get distracted. So defensive driving, driving smarter and safer is not just about putting in skills and habits that will keep you safe when other people make mistakes or other people do something arrogant or other people insist that they have the right of way. Defensive driving is also in place to keep you safe when you make mistakes because we all make mistakes when we're driving. We're human beings. It's the same thing. We put a coffee table in our living room. We're going to bang our knees on it. We're going to stub our toe on it because we're in motion. It is a biological fact that as soon as you put human beings in, in motion, they're going to run into something. They're going to bang into something. Whether they do it on purpose, by accident, or somebody pushes them, it is going to happen. And it's even worse when you put us into cars. It's even worse when you put us in cars. And you just look at traffic crashes and traffic deaths over the 20th century. More people died in traffic crashes in the 20th century than soldiers sent to every war in that century. Yes, every war in that century. More people die on American roads every year than all of the soldiers killed in the Vietnam War. Just let that sink in for a minute. More soldiers, or more people die, more drivers and road users die in car crashes every year in the United States of America than all the soldiers sent to war in the Vietnam War which lasted from 1963 to 1975, a dozen years. Traffic crashes are serious. It's a big deal. But nobody seems to take notice of it because we get in our vehicle. It's nice and safe. We, it's, it's our second most prominent personal space in our world next to our house, right? And traffic crashes don't happen very often. We know that most drivers will crash once every 15 to 20 years. So in their lifetime of driving, we know that drivers will have three or four crashes. Most of the time, the system of driving, the social activity of driving, the other people who are involved in driving will compensate for your errors and mistakes on the roadway. So it's only going to get you every now and again. So this is what I'm saying about putting habits and skills in place that are going to keep you safe. Not today, not next month, not next year, maybe not even five years, but in seven years, it might prevent that crash and save your life or save somebody else's life because defensive driving isn't just about you making mistakes on the roadway. It's about other people making mistakes. Or sorry, <laughs> it isn't just about other people making mistakes on the roadway. It's also about you making mistakes because we get distracted, we get tired. The kids are in the back seat fighting. The dog is doing something goofy on the front seat. Those types of things. It all happens, right? All right, uh, Rob, stop when you get the pizza angle. Uh, straighten out your wheels and proceed. Pr uh, proceed. Pizza is the solution. Awesome. Just talking about parallel parking there, I suspect. Uh, my friend uh, Consult the Prophets from Ghana, and it's 12.35 a.m. Thank you for tuning in, my friend, all the way from Ghana. That is awesome, awesome. We also see somebody here from the U.K. Uh, usually Klaus is here from Germany, uh, so it is the middle of the night for those people there. Uh, Mallory, the snowstorm went from Halifax to Cape Breton Island, so well over 150 centimeters of snow. It's 150 centimeters of snow is a meter and a half. That's about five feet of snow. That's a good snowstorm, okay? And I have not seen one like that in a very long time. <laughs> and I had a friend of mine on Facebook, and she obviously was in Nova Scotia, and uh, she sent a picture, and the car was buried in the driveway. And I can remember snowstorms like that when I was a kid, where you'd get up in the morning and you couldn't find the car because it was buried in snow. That, <laughs> that is good. That's a good snowstorm, indeed. Uh... Shroff, how do you get the 45? Uh, the pizza angle, as Rob was saying as well, generally the 45 degree angle uh, on most cars is going to be right in the crook of the uh, wing mirror, the side mirror on the driver's side there. So it's between the pillar, the piece of metal that holds the front windshield in, there's the pillar and there's the wing mirror here. And it's usually right between there is where your 45 is going to be. Now, it's gonna be a little bit of practice 
Corey will put up the playlist on parallel parking for you. And there are going to be some variables when you're parallel parking, but that's how you find your 45 for the most part. And Corey's put that up already. He's already way ahead of me. So thank you for that. All right, uh, Ross, and I'm doing good. And I have a great habit, always checking my blind spots every time I'm turning and changing lanes. Awesome. And that is really great to hear. And hopefully we can get more of this information out to drivers and try and convince them to shoulder check. Unfortunately, there are the few that are going to leave comments and they're going to say, well, why do you need to shoulder check? I just drove by there. Why do I need to shoulder check? Because traffic is dynamic. It's always changing. Okay. We have people, road users in place on the roadways who are in motion. Their position is always changing. So you need to be always observing because they're always moving. So you need to have the 360 degree awareness around your vehicle. You need to have the shoulder checking. Now, going back to the videos that I put up, the short, uh, the one short that I put up uh, was to put the, in an automatic transmission, car fitted with an automatic transmission, put the transmission into neutral when you're coming up to brake on snow and ice and any other slippery conditions. The reason I tell you to do that, first and foremost, as I said in the presentation, why would you use a $20,000 drivetrain to save $1,000 brakes? Okay, that thinking of slowing down the vehicle with the drivetrain using engine braking is left over from the 1950s. Okay, and I can see how this happens because grandpa taught dad and dad taught me how to drive and grandpa learned how to drive in the 1950s and brakes were unreliable in the 1950s. They were, and you had to gear down to be able to guarantee that you were gonna get the vehicle stopped at the intersection. Well, then the 1970s came along and they split your brake system on your car into two independent systems, the front and the back. It's two independent systems. If the back fails, the front will still continue to work. <laughs> and I love this because there's still questions floating around on the internet about what do I do if my brakes fail? Uh, well, are you driving a Model T? Really? Because that's what you're driving if the brakes fail. Okay, anything built after 1972 is going to have these two independent systems on the braking system. So if one fails, the other one will still continue to work. Yes, it's going to not be as uh, vigorous braking, but you're still going to get the vehicle stopped. Not to mention your parking brake also acts as an emergency brake. Now this is something that I need to do a test on uh, with the new electric activated parking brakes to see whether they will actually stop your vehicle and still act as an emergency brake as they once would. But the reality is, is that uh, brakes uh, are unlikely to fail unless they are in terrible, horrible uh, maintenance condition then they're going to work, all right? So that's the first piece. Why would you use a $20,000 drivetrain to save $1,000 brakes? The second piece is if you're just using the brakes to slow down the vehicle and the back end of the car kicks out because it loses traction on slippery conditions and a locked or spinning wheel always leads. So in other words, if you kick down on the throttle and you spin the back tires, say we got a rear wheel drive just for sake of uh, example, the back tires are spinning, the back end will kick out and it will start to go sideways and you'll get that yaw. Uh, same thing with front wheel drive. If you have a front wheel drive and you spin the tires, the front end will go sideways. Spinning or lock tire always leads. So you come up to the intersection, you gear down, wah, you get your engine braking, the back end locks up on slippery conditions because you have almost zero traction and now the back end kicks out. If you're using engine braking, you have no backup. You're stuck. You're going where the car decides to go. Whereas, if you come up and you're on snow and ice and you pop the transmission into neutral and you're just using the brakes and then the back end kicks out or the front end goes sideways, you can take your foot off the brake, allow the wheels to spin again and the vehicle will straighten out. And when you get up to the corner, you just pop it back into drive and away you go. The, the last piece of this, now, and I know that this won't work on push button automatic transmissions, okay? This only works if you have a column shift, okay? 
So the last piece about this is most people have no idea how the, um, the shifter works in an automatic transmission. If you pull it out of park, you, got, you push the button, the lock button, you push the lock button, you pull it just a little bit so it pops out of park, you let go of the, the lock button, you slide it back, it will stop in park. Okay? And then you can push it forward, it'll go into neutral, you push it back and it just goes into park. That's all it will do. If you take a minute with your automatic transmission and figure out these things, you can look way cooler when you're driving because you're doing what the machine is designed to do. Not working against the machine or trying to figure out how to make it do something you want it to do. And the number of people I see get in an automatic transmission and they push the button and then they look at the, the shifter and they go, uh, reverse, neutral, uh, drive. Yeah, we're in drive. And then they let go of the button. <laughs> Just, it does a certain thing. It's designed to go from park to drive. Just click the lock button, pull it a little bit, let go of the, and pull it all the way down. You'll just, you'll look way cooler to your friends when they get in the car and you're driving, okay? So, know that. There you go. There's the one thing. Uh, work 280 uh, in Saskatchewan. We had rain and, oh my God, the ice is so bad. Yes. All right. Uh, Rob, why do examiners still require turning wheels for parking on a hill if brakes aren't likely to fail these days? Okay. So, two different things there, Rob. Excellent question. The reason they uh, require you for turning wheels is because we're talking about parking brakes. So three reasons we engage the brakes on a vehicle. Service brakes, so basically the foot pedal, we're going down the road, we push on the brake pedal, blah, 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 okay? Parking brakes. So the parking brake is either mechanical force, which is coming out of you, you're pulling a lever, or you're pushing down on a pedal uh, in the footwell on the driver's side and then emergency brakes, right? If the brakes fail and we don't have any brakes, we can use the parking brakes as an emergency brake to bring the vehicle to a stop. The parking brakes are different than the service brakes because the parking brakes are a different power source, okay? The foot pedal is hydraulic and there's a power booster on that in the pump underneath the hood, okay? The parking brakes, on the other hand, are used mechanical or it's an electric motor that actuates the parking brakes. And those potentially could fail. Okay, the cable could break, they could be weak, out of adjustment, those types of things. So they get you to turn the wheels as a backup. Okay, and that's what we always want. We always want a backup, right? We always want somewhere else we can go. It's the same thing with observation and communication. If we miss something when we're observing, we got the backup that we signal. It's the same thing with the parking on a hill. We use the wheels against the curb or point it into the shoulder so that we have a backup if in the unlikely event that the parking brake fails, okay? Because we know uh, with people with automatics, most drivers who are driving automatic transmissions, they rarely use the parking brake. So it almost never gets used, right? Because uh, unfortunately they mislabeled the park <laughs> in automatic transmissions. They should have just called it stop. Uh, what they should have done because most people think oh, it's park I just put it in park and the vehicle is secure the vehicle's not secure because the transmission is not designed To hold that vehicle. Okay, we have a backup. We use the parking brake So we have the parking brake and we have the transmission as a backup So that's why they get you to do that uh, Marizone, why is the reason crash happens more in two-lane highways? Uh, Marizone, the reason that more crashes happen on two-lane highways is owing to the space, the shared space. Uh, animals on the roadway, slow-moving vehicles, horses, those types of things, all the obstructions that are on two-lane highways. They're curvy. Uh, people are not paying attention. Oftentimes, crashes happen at night. Many, many, many more crashes. I think it's three times the number of crashes happen at night on country rural roads. And the reason that most crashes on uh, rural roads are fatal, usually it's alcohol related. They're inebriated in some way, uh, either drugs or alcohol. They're tired, okay? They're driving at high speeds, often too fast for the roadway and the conditions of the roadway. And if they do get into a crash, uh, it's hard for somebody to find them. Even in this day and age of cell phones and whatnot, uh, they're usually laying there 
with the crash and it's usually 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour before somebody comes along and finds them. And many of these rural crashes are also single vehicle crashes. There's nobody else around. It's just one vehicle in a, or one person in a car. I think the number, and I would need to look it up and confirm that for you. I think it's almost 60% of these fatal crashes on uh, rural two lane highways are single vehicle crashes. So there's only one person in the vehicle. So, uh, you know, they're lying there unconscious and they can't call anybody. And then it's a matter of finding you, getting emergency crews to you, and then getting you to the hospital. And we also know because of the Vietnam War uh, that we have the golden hour, right? The trauma hour. We know that people who sustain serious trauma, serious injuries, we need to get them into surgery within 60 minutes for the likelihood, the significant likelihood of them surviving that crash going up. So those are all the pieces of why crashes are more fatal on two lane country roads. All right, uh, Rob, okay, I should have taken some mechanical training. Uh, makes sense, thanks Rick. Uh, no worries, Rob. <laughs> I, I've been working on a case of air brakes. So I've been talking about this, thinking about this, writing about this for the last week or so, but that's all good. Um, and you know, Rob, you're no different. Uh, you're a driving instructor. You don't really know about mechanically how the car works. And we don't teach people that, especially about brakes, right? This is why so many people have the false assumption or the false information, rather. They have the false information that brakes on a car will fail. Brakes on a car won't fail, okay? It's unlikely in this day and age. I mean, unless the, the, the vehicle is so poorly maintained, then yes, it will fail. But well-maintained brakes will not fail because the system is designed to have a fail-safe. And it has two fail-safes. It's divided into two independent systems, the front and the back. And then the parking brake can be used as an emergency brake. So that's the three reasons that we apply brakes. And it's the same on your car as it is in a big truck with air brakes. Service brake, the foot pedal, the parking brake and the emergency brake. So there's three reasons we apply the brakes, but it's only one brake, two power sources, one brake, okay? <laughs> Rob says, no idea how a car works. And you're no different than most other people, Rob. Uh, you know, that's not unusual. Uh, Eric, on a hill, you turn inward to the curb so that your car doesn't reverse or slide into the traffic, correct? Uh, Eric, it's the three-in-one rule, okay? So everything is towards the shoulder of the road except uphill with a curb. Uphill with a curb, up, up, and away like Superman, okay? So up, up, and away. So that's the only one where you turn it to the center of the road and then you let the car roll back until the back of the tire rests on the curb. And Corey's put up the video, I believe, there on hill parking. Yes, he has. Thank you for that, Corey. Have a look at that. So it's the three-in-one rule. Everything is towards the shoulder except uphill with a curb. And remember Superman for that one, up, up, and away. Okay. And on a driver's test, if you forget which way to turn the wheels, uh, just go with towards the shoulder of the road. And if it's wrong, you miss the one thing, it's only going to be five or 10 points. It's not a big deal. Okay. All right. Uh, excellent. Answer that question. 280. So a buddy was going for their test and they practiced before their test and there was water on the road and then they went to park for the test, pulled the e-brakes, said there, and it froze on them. Uh, 280, that somebody's, somebody's not telling you the truth here because uh, that's not true, okay? Um, if there was water on the roadway and you put the parking brake on, that vehicle would have to sit there for two or three days uh, before the brake shoes froze to the drums or the calipers froze to the discs. It's very unlikely that that is going to happen. It would have to be incredibly cold. The vehicle would have to sit there for a very long time. Uh, I drove truck for a lot of years um, and talked to a lot of different drivers. The only time that brake shoes will freeze to the drum, because you have to realize that the brake shoe is a chemical composition of really nasty stuff. And then the, sh the drum is steel. So you're getting something that is worn like a ceramic, uh, brake drum, you're getting ceramic to freeze to metal. And the only time that I have heard of that happening is in minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 40 degree, uh, 50, minus 50, 40 degree Fahrenheit, minus 40 degrees Celsius. It's the same temperature for both of them. Uh, 
those kinds of temperatures are the only time that I've had brakes freeze. Now, the other time that I had brakes freeze is one time exactly what you were saying, driving through a lot of water, freezing rain, wet snow, dropped the trailer, and then I came back two days later to get the trailer, and yes, the brakes had frozen, but once I put air to the system and then I jockeyed the trailer back and forth a little bit, then the brakes did freeze. But if you're just going for a driver's test and the brakes are wet and you put the parking brake on, uh, in that kind of few minutes that you're there parked, they're not gonna freeze. It, that's not true, okay? Uh, Mallory, when I am in the vehicle with my parents, I will shoulder check from the passenger seat just to say I've done it, and that is awesome, my friend. Uh, Emily, what will the brake pedal just lose as pressure? Is that possible? Uh, as I said, Emily, that's not possible that the brake pedal will just lose pressure because as I said, the system, the hydraulic brake system is separated into two independent systems, okay? So there's the front brakes and the back brakes and they're two completely separate systems. So if there's a leak on the front system, it will just leak hydraulic fluid out on that. And then you will still have the brakes on the back of the car, okay? So yeah, you won't have the same braking force to get the vehicle stopped, but the vehicle will still stop. Uh, and in the unlikely event that your brake does get really soft and you don't have any braking power, you can use your parking brake. And as I said, I need to do a video, <coughs> excuse me, on electric parking brakes just to make sure that that still works as an emergency brake. And it should, okay? It should, because that's part and parcel of braking systems on cars. Uh, Eric, do you need a can of air for brakes, of air brakes to extra brake fluid? Uh, Eric, as part of your monthly checks on your vehicle, so you're gonna go through all the fluids under the hood once a month, okay? You're gonna check your brake fluid, uh, which is the master cylinder, which is right in front of the steering wheel in the engine compartment. Uh, you're gonna check your power steering, you're gonna check your radiator fluid, uh, check your oil. You should be checking your oil every couple of weeks though. Uh, and windshield washer fluid, all of the fluids underneath the hood and uh, the brake fluid is one of the things that you should be checking. 280, uh, there was puddles everywhere. Uh, okay, still it's not going to because you have to understand 280 that with the brakes, the brakes are also sealed, okay? They're not open, okay? The disc, the caliper and the um, rotor are open, but there's just not enough surface area for those two things to freeze together. And you gotta understand, even if it gets wet, it's the unlikeliness of it freezing it has to be sub-zero temperatures, really, really cold. So it's 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 just not likely, okay? It's not likely. Uh, Emily, you have an electric parking brake? Yes, and uh, Tracy's Audi has an electric parking brake as well. Uh, Rob says, my tires froze to the ground one time because I parked in a puddle which froze overnight. Uh, not fun. <laughs> yes, it happens. <laughs> it does happen. But the chances of your brakes freezing is unlikely. And I, you know, I hate to say this, but I've had the buggy now for almost 10 years. I put the parking brake on every time. I've had it in sub-zero temperatures. I've driven through all kinds of weather, all kinds of rain, wet, snow, whatnot. And I've never had a problem with the parking brake on the buggy. It's always worked. And people say that to me all the time. They, oh, it's going to freeze up. It's going to rust up. It's not going to do this. I will tell you something right now from a mechanical point and knowing this because I grew up with equipment. I worked on a farm when I was a kid. I've been driving trucks pretty much my whole life, been in the industry and those types of things. Equipment fails more when it's parked than when it's being used, okay? Because you're not maintaining it, it's just sitting there. If you have a sports car, like an old 66 Chevelle or whatnot, something that you absolutely love, and you put it up on blocks on the on uh, in the garage for the winter time. That is harder on it than if you drove it all winter, because everything's working, everything's moving, getting lubricated, and those types of things. It was the same thing when I was a kid. In the winter time, they used to stick all the farm equipment into the driving shed, or it would sit outside over the winter time. And in the spring, there was inevitably this mountain of work that had to be done. Bearings had to be replaced and those types of things because things rust, moisture gets in there, it seizes, those types of things. It is harder on equipment to have it sit than it is to, to drive it and run it and operate it. 
okay? And of course, this all has to go along with you doing good maintenance on your vehicle and whatnot. So that's going to play a role as well. 247, I've had my road test Friday. Any advice before I take it? Yes. Observation, communication, space management, speed management, okay? Make sure you have that space in front of your vehicle because if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to hit anything. Uh, one vehicle length when stopped in traffic. Uh, Corey will put up the videos for you on automatic fails and common errors and chance events that could happen on your road test. Those three videos will help you out. Definitely have a look at those three videos in preparation for your driver's test on Friday. And again, I would suggest go back and revisit your parallel parking, uh, your reverse stall parking, backing into a parking spot, and your three-point turn. If you do all of that, that's really going to help you out in preparation for your test on Friday. And good luck on your test on Friday there. Okay, uh, Mary, that's what I thought would happen with my car when it sat for four months over the coldest part of the winter, but it released fine. Uh, the wheels made a noise, but it also released as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so Mary, in four months isn't too bad. It's when you leave it for six months and those types of things. But, you know, now that you're driving it and whatnot, it's going to be just fine. Uh, Rob, my 2018 Nissan Versa sits in my driveway for at least six days a week without running. Uh, should I move it more? Yeah, if you're driving it once a week, uh, you're probably going to be okay with that. Uh, Rob, it's when you're just, it's just sitting there not doing anything for months and months and months on end, okay? Uh Marizone, how many kilometers are in the buggy? The buggy is approaching 400,000 kilometers. It's just over 395,000 kilometers right now. So yeah, we're just about at 400,000. I'll send, I'll put a picture up on the community chat when it gets to 400,000. So that'll be really great. <laughs> 280, I agree with you. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> there we go. All right, we're going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, Thank you so much for participating in the live stream. Thanks so much for your awesome questions. And uh, if you had a driver's test in the last couple of weeks that you've passed, congratulations on that. That is awesome. And if you have a driver's test coming up in the next week on Friday and those types of things, good luck on that. Thank you, Corey, for putting up those great videos uh, for more information that people can have a look at. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.